and welcome to this session of Shape Your Futures series, where we're exploring the STEM career journeys of Australia's rising stars. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Jai Jai Lee, generally known as JJ to her friends. I'm Adam Johnston. I'm a PhD student at Macquarie University, and I'm also part of the Catalyst program at the Academy of Technology and Engineering. We're gathering here from around Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge the various traditional custodians of the land, acknowledging that I'm on the Gadigal country of Sydney. We pay respects to elders past, present, and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people meeting with us today. Before we get into this session proper, you will have seen that it is being recorded. This and all talks in this series will be available on the Stella YouTube channel for you to revisit at any time. There is also a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen so that if you have questions during the talk, drop them in and we'll try to get to all of them later after the discussion at the end. There is also a chat function, but questions should go into the question function, which I've just mentioned. Finally, you will be sent a feedback form and worksheet after this session to email to the email that you have registered with. Please let us know what went well and what you might like to see in our series, series as we go on through the year. Dr. JJ is a biomedical engineer and medical researcher. She works in the field of tissue engineering, combining biological sciences with engineering to create replacement organs and body parts. Thanks to her engineering background, JJ is trained to work across multiple disciplines from cell biology, material science, nanotechnology, and data science. Her current research focuses on developing new tissue engineering strategies to help heal injured and diseased bones and joints. With that, I'd like to invite JJ to make a presentation to us on her work. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Adam. Um, can, can everyone, is my voice coming through okay? And the video? Yes, yeah, everything's good? Yep, you're good. Thank you. Okay, so I'll get started. And I would also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Yora Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which I am currently sitting in Sydney. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So the, the my talk today is about can you engineer an organ? And I am a biomedical engineer. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career journey first into how I got into my current role as an academic at UTS. And then I I will take you a little bit through a general overview of STEM and biomedical engineering. Um, and then I will give you a glimpse into my own work and finish off with some, I guess, career advice into what kind of subjects or what kind of degrees to choose at uni, depending on what you want out of your long-term career goals. So, and then I'm, I will be very happy to take any questions at the end. So. Um, Oh, yep. So um, I'm coming to you today as an academic from UTS, but also a Science and Technology Australia a current cohort of superstar of STEM. So I was one of 60 women across Australia representing all different disciplines of STEM and trying to basically push out STEM to the community and get more of you guys into future careers in STEM. So I'm a biomedical engineer. I build new organs and body parts to replace disease and damaged ones. And in my research, 
coach. So I've recently won, I guess, two relatively, we would say, international and national prestigious awards. So one was a Falling Walls Lab. So I was the overall Australian winner last year. This was a, a research pitch competition. And also I was this year, one of this year's New South Wales Young Tall Poppy Award winners as well. So... Um, I thought I'll just start a little bit about my own career journey as a biomedical engineer. And I guess like my um, career journey has been a little bit linear in terms of, um, anyway, so let's, we'll just, I'll just take you through it. So in 2004, okay, a very long time ago, probably some of the, some of you guys were born around then or um, not even born yet. I graduated from Sydney Girls High School and I went into a double degree at the University of Sydney. And that was a combined Bachelor of Medical Engineering and Bachelor of Medical Science. And the reason why I chose that degree was completely out of serendipity. And I did not attend any career talks um, during my high school years, which I kind of regret now. But um, I mean, I wouldn't have chosen anything else. Like looking back at it, I thoroughly enjoy being a biomedical engineer and a medical scientist. I love my, I love my career and I love what I do. But um, it wasn't a very well thought out um choice at the time. So I was sitting in this lecture theatre at Sydney Uni and the reason why I picked Sydney Uni was because it was the, low, the closest um, uh, university to where I was living at the time. And I was looking through the list of possible degree choices and I didn't really know what I wanted to do specifically, but I, I knew that I was interested in something science-y. Um, I didn't know what engineering was at the time and also something medical. And this combined degree had um, science, engineering, and something medical related. And I thought, okay, that's a good combination. And also you get to have two bachelor's degrees in five years, which normally separately, they would have taken three and four years or so seven years in total. And I was like, okay, that's a good value for time. I'll just sign up for this degree. And then I went into the degree and I was like, oh, this is what engineering is. <laughs> you know, like it was like statics, dynamics, fluid mechanics, material science, design, um, all sorts of weird and wonderful things um, coupled with some human anatomy, physiology and medical device design whatever not anyway um it was a very interesting experience I totally loved it but I ended up there by serendipity so I graduated in 2010 and I was very fortunate to have topped my cohort in biomedical engineering in the bachelor of biomedical engineering at Sydney uni in that particular year so that's why I was awarded the uni medal and I think that was the sort of the reason why I decided to go on to a PhD straight away. Um, I guess three reasons. So firstly, because I guess I was a little bit more confident then about my academic ability. And also um, as part of the degree of engineering, you have to do a three month internship. That was what the degree was at the time at Sydney Uni. Um, for all engineering degrees, probably you have to do um, a internship at any university. Like currently at UTS, you have to do two periods of six month internships. And I actually think it's a great thing because you get to have some industry relevant experience before you even graduate. And that is something that employers really um, look for. And so it was great to be able to build up some graduate ready skills. But my particular internship I didn't enjoy so much and it was nothing to do with the company itself I was in a marketing role at a biomedical devices company and I don't think I got a lot of intellectual stimulation um, I didn't appreciate the fact that I was in an office from nine to five like not really applying my biomedical um, engineering knowledge and the so that was one of the reasons why I chose not to go into industry after my degree and this um, the third reason now I suppose is that I thoroughly absolutely loved my honors project so you get to do a honors or capstone research project um, under a supervisor in your final year at university in an engineering degree and my research project was in tissue engineering which I'll tell you a little bit about later it was basically like the a glimpse into grow, regrowing tissues and organs and in that particular case it was in a sup, with a supervisor who works a lot with biomaterials to regrow bone and I absolutely loved it like it was I was working in the lab I was doing hands-on experiments I was generating data I was writing up my own experiments and and thesis and I was just like this is if this is what research is about that's where I want to be 
And so I guess all of this combined made me going to a PhD directly. That took five years, a little bit longer than what a normal PhD would take, but um, I got it done in the end. I was waiting on some results with international collaborators and that's why it took a while. But anyway, so I graduated in 2015, had a period of downtime because of a family, um, I guess uh, one of my family members passed away at the time. And so I took a little bit of time off and I did a lot of ca random bits of casual work. So it was a bit of teaching, a bit of admin, um, a, a bit of casual clinical work, um, which was all good experience, but I wasn't in any kind of a full-time role at the time. But what I did do during that downtime was publish some papers um, from the results that I generated during my PhD. And I also applied for this thing called a National Health and Medical Research Council Early Career Fellowship. And that is, um, I guess, the most prestigious fellowship that you can get from the Australian government to do medical research um, in your postdoctoral training. And I was very lucky because I only had one chance because of the eligibility. And if I didn't get this, I really have no idea where I would be now. Probably continuing on to um, this, making this a bit more formalized in terms of like a clinical kind of role, but I don't think it would have been my first choice. But this brought me to a research institute called the Colling Institute, which is part of the Royal North Shore Hospital, but it's also affiliated with Sydney Uni. And that was when I did my postdoctoral research training, going a bit more from biomaterials, which was my PhD, into stem cells and regenerative medicine. And during that same time, my previous PhD supervisor also successfully bid for a Australian Research Council training centre, which was $7 million altogether um, from the government and also industry funding and that sustained about 150 researchers and students over the um, lifetime of the centre and we've just recently wrapped it up so that was a great experience because I was involved um, as one of the project leaders under the centre. So as of 2020, um, at the end of my fellowship, I transitioned into an academic role at UTS. So now I do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So I do um, research, obviously. So that would involve supervising students, conducting experiments, designing and actually doing lab work in the lab. Uh, I would write grants, write papers, uh, present at conferences about my research. I teach undergraduate and postgraduate biomedical engineering. So if you come to UTS, then I um, will probably meet you. Um, and there are uh, admin surrounding this. And also about, I sit on about seven or eight international and national committees for professional scientific societies um, surrounding my area of research. I do outreach. so seminars like this and also um, a bunch of school visits every year, um, presentations for National Science Week and also try and advocate for science and medical research and also do science communication. Basically try and get science more into the community and try and get more people into careers in STEM. So that's enough about me. What I wanted to take you through today was um, basically having a glimpse into careers in STEM and well, careers in STEM and what STEM is all about. And it's science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and also medicine as an extra M on the end. And in my biased opinion, as a biomedical engineer, I would say that biomedical engineers are the interface of the STEM fields. And there's a very good reason for that. And you'll see why very soon. And as an engineer, I would say that our biggest difference compared to scientists is that, and I mean, I am a scientist as well, but I still, I prefer to think of myself as an engineer because um, we have a lot of skills that I think other disciplines don't necessarily get trained in. So I think the scientists to me are the ones that generate new knowledge about the world they have a hypothesis about something that is unknown and they're going to experiment or experiments to try and build up new knowledge and I think the engineers do a bit of that discovery but really they're the ones that use the knowledge knowledge that has been built up over the years and generate and develop new and enabling technologies to make this world a better place and as a biomedical engineer you do that you invent new technologies to improve our human health and try and treat disease, which to me is um, the best job in the world. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, engineers work on building capacity and developing practical skills. And we have a, we build up a lot of problem solving, critical thinking and information analysis skills as part of your training. Also soft skills like communication, teamwork, leadership, and also project management, multidisciplinary training and practical experience. So equipping you for a lot of graduate ready skills. So what is biomedical engineering? Um, 
And, you know, as I was saying before, so engineers to me are really the ones that solve people's problems. Um, biomedical engineers are the ones that solve problems relating to human health and disease. So biomedical engineering is all of this and much more. So the first thing that you usually think of are orthopedic devices like hip and, um, hip and knee implants and spinal implants, uh, heart assist devices, so mechanical heart devices, stents to open up blood vessels, um, 3D printing for various models and uh, biomedical devices and also biomedical design as well. So this is actually an artificial knee tap as part of a knee implant that you can design and then 3D print. And this is the field that I work in, so tissue engineering, which is regrowing tissues and organs. This was a artificial trachea or windpipe that was used to treat a patient whose own um, trachea collapsed because of disease. And we not us, but you know, scientists in the field made a scaffold out of biocompatible materials and then put the patient's own cells back on to create this artificial but um, trachea that is exactly similar to the patient's own trachea, put it back in the patient to replace their diseased one and it saved the patient's life. And this happened like what, 10 years ago and the patient is still alive today. So it could really be a life-changing technology. Um, this is artificial skin. So like, you know, layers of skin can be grown in the lab and um, used to treat burns patients. And this is a thing that I made during my PhD, my baby project. So this is a construct that you can make um, what I made to replace missing bone and cartilage in joints. So the top bit is for cartilage and the bottom bit is for bone and they have different properties. So there is also um, all these other wonderful things. So virtual surgery, basically like a VR kind of game almost, but not really a game. It can be used for surgeon training. So the surgeon can virtually practice their surgery first before operating on real patients. So um, this is a really useful technology. There's also sort of medical imaging. So you can image, for instance, the brain, different areas would light up in response to um, stimulation and you can study neural behavior using this. There is also drug design. So different parts of the drug um, can be designed like the, these different side chains so that you can target specific areas of the body and have specific actions, for instance, um, killing tumors. And um, biosensors and nano devices. So this is a huge field. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but essentially a biosensor is something that senses in real time what happens inside the body. So whether it be changes in pH or glucose levels or um, more complex uh, metabolites, like certain molecules you want to sense, then we are able to do this and get data in real time about what's happening inside the body. And nano devices, um, a best example probably is a nano a robot that is a nanoscale sized robot that can be used to deliver drugs to specific areas of the body to, for instance, target tumors like cancers to only kill the cancer cells and spare the surrounding healthy cells. And then there's bionic everything. So like bionic years, um, Cochlear is Australia's um, biggest company and probably one of, if not the world's leader in this space, where you have a receiver for external sound signals that then get transmitted into the inner ear. So the patient has lost this conduction mechanism, but then through the bionic ear implant, they can have sound signals transmitted to stimulate the hair cells at the back of the um, at the back of the ear in the inner ear, so the patient can hear again. If you look at their website, um, I think they have videos of like little babies who were born with this disorder or little kids and then they switch on and hear their parents or their loved ones for the first time and you see the expression you're just like okay this is the reason why I'm here <laughs> in this field um, and bionic eyes as well so like using a camera to capture visual information and relaying that in electrical signals to the back of the brain to the visual cortex so that blind patients can see again or maybe not color and depth but at least they can see contours and navigate their environment there's bionic kidney so that um, becoming more and more portable and connected potentially to a smartphone device so that patients who need dialysis don't need to at least visit the hospital as frequently. And bionic arms to rehabilitate amputee patients. Um, for instance, like it's, the technology has gotten to a stage where it can be connected to a amputated limb and connected to the neural wiring so that by thinking about it, you're able to make some hand gestures like this little girl is making here. So all of that, like all of this happened, I would say in the last 10 to 20 years. And this field is so like biomedical engineering is so rapidly evolving. And it's really up to you guys <laughs> to take all of these fascinating technologies forward. 
So um, just saying that it's a really big umbrella encompassing a lot of different aspects. And there is really a bit of biomedical engineering for anyone really, um, if you want to work in the STEM fields. So I was just going to um, go through a few slides on tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, which is the area that I work in. And tissue engineering is all about trying to harness the body's ability to heal itself. So currently, if we have an injured tissue, like an injured bone, for instance, um, like we surgically, like the surgeon tries to fix it with metal plates or a implant that replaces partly the functions of the diseased or damaged organ or tissue, which is usually not perfect because, I mean, in the case of orthopedic implants, it's like a block of metal that sits in your body and it's not really natural and over time complications can occur. So it's a this really sort of drove the field of tissue engineering to evolve in the 1990s, whereby Back then, the pioneers of this field combined cells with a biomaterial scaffold to support the cells and also bioactive cues or molecules to stimulate the cells so that we can regrow whatever has been lost, whether it be bones or cartilage or heart or a liver or the kidney. So this field has really rapidly evolved in the last um, three decades since it was first established, but there is still a lot more to be done. So if I was in an in-person visit with you, I would have at this point asked you to guess what these different tissue engineer structures are. Um, so this is artificial skin. So this is basically a layer of skin cells that has been taken from the patient and then grown into sheets of cells that can then be used to, um, to help repair the person's damaged or burnt skin. This is a blood vessel. So it is an artificial blood vessel that contains a natural polymer called human elastin. So elastin is a molecule that we find in our body, but we don't make any more of this as soon as we're born. And that is a really big challenge for tissue engineered organs and tissues that need to have an elastic component, like your blood vessels, like your arteries, your skin, etc. So there is now a method to purify human elastin by expressing the gene in bacteria and then incorporating human elastin into structures like blood vessels. This is an artificial bone replacement. So back in my PhD lab, we actually, uh, well, like the team actually invented this material that can replace or help bones regrow. So this was part of a large animal sheep experiment um, before the material goes into first stage clinical trials. And this is a artificial uh, animal derived actually heart valve and this most likely probably came from a pig or kangaroo um, that's one of the ways that we can tissue engineer some complex structures like the heart valve where it has to open and close probably millions or hundreds of millions of times over a person's lifetime and the animal cells can be washed out and the patient cells can be put back on and this can be put into a human patient with valve disease so um, I'm just going to take you through a few brief slides about um, some of the things that I've personally seen in my projects for my research. So we make a lot of scaffolds that mimic normal tissue properties. In my area is bone or joint regeneration. So some of these materials can be 3D printed and used to repair bone and joints that have been damaged. And so this is the I guess, real life view of the thing I showed you earlier that I said I made during my PhD. So the bottom of it is supposed to be a bone replacement and the top bit is for cartilage. And this was um, this this was the results I was waiting on for my PhD or the end of it, the end of my PhD. Um, but we actually did insert this into a, uh, a large animal that has skeletal structure quite similar to humans. And, um, and I think the results were very promising. So um, unfortunately we didn't carry this project any further because I finished my PhD and left the lab, but um, I'm definitely trying to bring some of this back into my current research. So there's also nanomaterials and nanomedicine, nanoparticles. So you can see these are all nanometer size, like a couple of hundred nanometers, and they can be used for delivering biological therapeutics like genes, proteins, and drugs, which can be embedded within the nanoparticles with different shapes and sizes and delivered inside the body. There's also, um, we want 
biomedical implants to better integrate with the body and become a part of the body. So part of the way we can do that is to modify the nanotopography of the surface of the implant. So changing the topography or surface patterning of the implant so that they better interact with cells and um, the body's tissues once they're inserted. So you can see here, like this red thing and this blurry thing here are both cells attached onto different implant surfaces and they're interacting very favorably with the implant because they're all spread out and um, taking a holiday <laughs> instead of being scrunched up and not very happy. So you can definitely tell that, um, but just by actually just by changing the surface topography that you're able to change cell behavior and the way that the implant interacts with the body. So this is the area that I'm also working in at the moment. So I'm trying to use stem cells and their secreted bioactive factors for tissue repair. So I'm specifically doing this in a bone and joint kind of um, area where stem cells can produce these nanoscale biological particles called exosomes, and they contain a lot of weird and wonderful bioactive molecules, which are messengers and can improve tissue regeneration. So if we insert this back into a joint, for instance, um, it can help repair the cartilage and bone and also similarly for other organs as well. So this is an area that I'm currently um, going into in my research. And part of the way that we can get the stem cells to secrete more effective molecules to help treat disease is to give them different sorts of physical, mechanical and biochemical signals so that the stem cells can be primed, if you wish um, to call it that way, or conditioned to have better regenerative properties. And one of the ways we can do that is through biomaterials. So bringing back my biomaterials expertise to construct these 3D hydrogel systems. So essentially a polymer gel with lots of water inside um, that can provide different stiffnesses so harder as opposed to softer surfaces for example and that will affect the way that the stem cell responds to whatever they're grown on and so that they can have um, better or worse properties for tissue repair. So um, I think we're running pretty good for time so I'm going to rush through the next bit of slides um, that you know give you a glimpse into my particular work and then I'm going to finish off with um, I guess some um, FAQs and information about um, university degrees. So uh, <laughs> so why do we need tissue engineering? The, the primary reason for that is because relying on organ donation for people with organ failure is just not an option for a lot of people. There's a huge waiting list, like 10,000 in Australia alone. And even when you get a replacement organ, patients need to be on lifelong immunosuppression. And there's also lots of practical issues that limit the success of an organ transfer, as you can see here. Like it needs to get from the donor to the patient within a matter of hours. And it's just not possible. Um, definitely not internationally, but even nationally, like from Perth to Sydney, um, some of these organs would not last that long. And so tissue engineering is really about taking cells from the patient and growing them outside the body and then putting them onto support structures and recreating a construct that can then be put back into the patient to regrow their missing or diseased tissue or organ. And so um, I've published some reviews around this, but essentially, so this was the scaffold that I made to replace a bone and cartilage defect and also um, various scaffolds that I've also made to repair bone defects as well. Um, so we sort of talked about this, I'm just going to skip through this, but essentially just saying that the two different phases of this uh, cartilage and bone um, scaffold is having good properties that can regrow cartilage and bone respectively. And we did mechanical testing to make sure that the mechanical properties of both phases are similar to cartilage and bone respectively. And also the fact that you can grow stem cells inside so that they can grow into cartilage in the cartilage phase and the bone um, and when they're growing the bone phase, they become bone cells or express these what we call markers that sort of differentiate them from uh, going down a cartilage path as opposed to a bone path. So that was all looking very good there. Um, and then so like my current research is more into stem cells and stem cells are the ones that do the regeneration in tissue engineering. And there's, I mean, this is pulled out of my um, first year biomedical engineering lecture. So probably a bit too, um, just, uh, 
a, a bit of general knowledge, I suppose, but um, essentially saying that stem cells have two fundamental characteristics. So they're capable of becoming more specialized cells like your immune cells, epithelial cells, blood cells, bone cells, etc. And they're also capable of producing more copies of themselves as well to maintain the pool of stem cells so that they can continuously do regeneration in the adult human body. And there's different types of stem cells, which I'm not going to go through now, but these are essentially pictures that I've taken in my own lab. So these are what the cells look like under the microscope, under a certain magnification. So all of these are individual little cells. They're about 20 micrometers in length. And then we can prime them so that they become cartilage and bone. So this is when the cells have differentiated into bone and the red stuff is essentially standing for the calcium that they have secreted when they have become bone cells. And these are when the same cells have become cartilage cells. So you can see um, the, these are all the cells, they've changed their shape. Um, because they've differentiated into a different type of cell now, like a cartilage cell. And the purple stuff is all the, um, what we call proteoglycans, which is a fundamental uh, part of a cartilage, um, of cartilage tissue. So, and the extracellular vesicles are the, um, the bioactive uh, factors that I was talking about before, the nanoscale factors that we can extract from stem cells and use them as biological therapeutics. Um, and they're also nanometer size, like I'm not lying about this because we can see them under transmission electron microscopy. So you can see they're like about a hundred or a couple of hundred nanometers in diameter and we can use these potentially to treat diseases. And I think this is the paper that you have probably been shared with in the worksheet, but essentially saying that my current research is using these stem cell derived extracellular vesicles for various purposes, some of which can be used to treat diseases like osteoarthritis, joint inflammation and cartilage osteochondral injury. And also, um, so this was a paper that I wrote in 2019. And then um, this was with my team of students and after I've established my own lab at UTS. So um, expanding this out to a wider range of tissues, for instance, for musculoskeletal tissues, for neural tissues and cardiovascular tissues, we can use um, stem cell derived extracellular vesicles as a treatment option for um, all of these. I mean, the, it's not clinically available and a lot of researchers around the world are trying to get into this very exciting area. So that was the um, scientific content. And then now I just wanted to spend the last about 10 minutes or so, um, a, a little bit about careers in STEM and I guess career entry pathways and what you can come out to do with a, a degree in STEM. And I think this is not specific to UTS, although like I pulled this from a UTS slide, but it's universities who offer STEM degrees now are really trying to empower you, you guys, to be the STEM leaders of tomorrow. And most universities now are embracing these core values. These are certainly the values at UTS, and I believe they're pretty much across the board. We embrace practice-oriented learning. Um, basically exposing you to a lot of uh, opportunities and skill building that would make you ready for a real world job before you graduate from your degree. So through internships, through partners with industry, um, through exposing you to research that um, academics like myself and my colleagues are doing. And it will give you a lot of really practically relevant skills and be able to work in a lab or be able to work um, in partnership with industry before you graduate. Also preparing you for global workplace. So now that our borders are starting to open up, um, there are more exchange opportunities available and most unis would facilitate this as well so that you can potentially do a part of your degree overseas um, in exchange with a university or institution that is partnered with the university that you're doing your local degree at and also research inspired and integrated learning so like researchers like myself also do teaching in the same area and we integrate our latest research into our teaching like all the stuff you've seen before like was from my research and I integrate that into my lectures for undergraduate students and I also take on interns um, research interns who prefer to do a period of internship not with industry but with an academic because they're interested more in research and some of my interns last year um, I chucked them in the deep end <laughs> and I asked them to do a presentation in a student competition that was um, run by International Society in Tissue Engineering in my field and my undergraduate students won awards against like 
international PhD students, and I was super proud of them. So, um, you know, just an example of how universities are trying to integrate researchers um, into teaching as well and passing that knowledge down to the next generation. Um, these research themes for biomedical engineering are pretty common across the board, but um, particularly at UTS, there's uh, medical devices and implants, rehabilitation engineering, robotics, artificial intelligence, bioimaging, tissue engineering, as we were talking about before, um, all sorts of sequencing, single cell sequencing, omics like genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and bioinformatics microfluidics, organ on the chip, nanomedicine, biosensors, bioelectronics. So a very wide range of all sorts of weird and wonderful technologies. And obviously lots of industry partnerships as well. Um, and you can come out with quite a diverse range of career opportunities as a biomedical engineer, or probably like this would apply to anything um, in a STEM related degree more so like I think this is more related to a medical something that is medical related but nevertheless like you know if you come out with a science or engineering or some kind of medical related degree this is pretty much all open to you so you can do R&D for new technologies you can go to hospitals and clinics biotech and bio, bio manufacturing companies um, including agriculture as well as a huge field, um, pharmaceuticals, research institutes, regulatory affairs, and also um, bench to bedside and commercialization. So a lot of students uh, don't just do a straight engineering or science degree, they combine it with law or business, and then they would end up going into things like regulatory affairs and commercialization, which is an extremely important part of the product development pathway. Um, so uh, again, I'm using UTS as an example, but I think most universities are now removing prerequisites for um, most STEM uh, degrees. And But you, you, if you want to do a degree in science or engineering, at least, then um, I think assume knowledge would, like you have to do English, but Mass Extension 1 would be pretty um, standard as assumed knowledge and also physics and or chemistry. Um, you don't necessarily need to have done either because you get like in your first year uni, you do all the fundamental subjects related to physics and chemistry anyway. But um, I think it's just that if your mind can't be conditioned to do well in physics or do well in chemistry, like you might have a little bit of trouble, but it doesn't mean that you have to have done it during high school, if that makes sense. So I didn't do physics and I was completely fine an engineering degree um, and yeah so there's also bridging courses available um, entry so this is I mean like we're, we might be in different states but essentially um, in where I am the eight halfway biomedical engineering degree is usually around um, the high 80s or to the mid 90s and I'm just going to finish off with some FAQs and career choices because I get asked this a lot by high school students and I've also spoken to lots of high school students and I've tried to compile them around themes. So if you're someone who knows exactly what you want to do, then my advice is to just go for it. Um, don't let anything hold you back and especially don't let any external or internal voices second doubt yourself that you can't get into the degree that you want to get into, whether that be law, medicine, veterinary science, psychology, whatever it is. Um, do the right subjects, <laughs> make sure you satisfy if there's any prerequisites, get the marks and really just believe in yourself. Um, you know, like we all go through imposter syndrome a lot, um, especially the girls probably, because um, as a woman, I say this because we've actually had a seminar in Superstars of STEM about imposter syndrome. And most of the women feel imposter syndrome, but they say that many of their male colleagues don't feel it at all. And I think it's a genetic difference um, because I think evolutionarily, like my hypothesis is that the men were the ones that went out and fought animals and hunted and stuff. And so they're naturally more confrontational and confident, whereas the women are probably genetically conditioned to be more conservative and preserve their genes so that they can pass it down to the next generation. So don't let that sort of genetic conditioning affect you and don't let external internal voices tell you that something is not for you because that's not true.
If you have no idea what you want to do, um, if you're still like earlier than year 12, then look around, um, broaden your interest, try to sort of do a bit of different activities, go to university open days. Um, they're currently, at least in New South Wales, they're being held in the coming next week or two um, around the major unis. So definitely go to the open days, go to the different faculties within the open days um, of the unis that you know for the degrees that you're interested in go and talk to the people like myself who are currently teaching those degrees go and talk to the current students they're all going to be there um don't listen to like unverified sources of information like get it from where you're actually trying to go um try and sign up for uni internships as well a lot of unis are trying to partner with um high schools now and also while you're doing all of this just maintain a decent mark because you don't want to get to a stage where you know what you want to do but then you don't have the mask to get in um and a lot of you might be in this category so you sort of know what you want to do but you don't know which degree to choose and my advice there is just to look inside yourself have a feel of what your strengths are and what you're interested in and what you want out of your career and I guess one way you can think about it is if you're more creative and you really enjoy designing and, um, you know, having creating something that looks really nice kind of thing, then you might want to look into, say, architecture, um, design or visual arts or something that is, um, I guess, like art and creative related. If you're more adventurous, biology might be the thing for you because biologists go on a lot of different field trips. Um, marine biologists go on deep sea dives. I have a friend who's a geoscientist. She goes and looks at erupting volcanoes around the world, which I think is pretty cool. Um, if you're more process driven, then maybe accounting, actuary, studies or law might be the thing for you if you're more analytical science or engineering is definitely the thing to look into and if all of that doesn't help you then think about what is your number one aspiration like if there was one thing that you wanted to solve in the world would it, what would it be would it be climate change would it be poverty would it be a particular disease that maybe your family or someone you know is affected by by and what can you do to try to solve that problem and you can come at it in different ways like say for climate change you can be a environmental scientist and advise industries on the environmental impacts of their projects or you can be a medical scientist and develop new um, or an engineer and develop new uh, medical treatments for people who are affected by pollution or you could be an engineer who designs new renewable sources of energy or you could be a politician to change policy on climate change around the world or in your nation so there's different ways of solving the same problem and you need to speak to your strength and think about what you're passionate about and bring I guess put your mark in the ground and bring your contribution to this problem um looking to combine degrees so if you don't exactly know what you want to do a combined degree is a great choice usually science or engineering can be combined with things like law like arts international studies business commerce so um there's usually quite a bit of flexibility but that depends on the university so that's what you need to find out at open days there's also different placement opportunities and also think about career entry pathways like what does the uni offer you to be able to get into the career that you want which university should you go to? It really doesn't matter. <laughs> like I did my degrees at Sydney Uni. I've worked there for a while and then I came to UTS and, um, you know, the universities have differences in strengths. They have differences in rankings. They have differences in teaching and research culture. And each university has its own goods and bads. Rankings are not the only thing. And to be honest, really, like when I see um, student scholarship applications, for instance, on my side, I don't look at which school you came from. So same thing, like when I apply for grant funding to the government or to some funding body, they don't look at which uni I come from. So it doesn't matter. Like they look at whether the university has the technical facilities and resources to be able to support me in my research. So it needs to have strength in my area of research, not the overall ranking of the university. So it's the same for students. And really employers and organizations look for people with passion, plus also experience and diversity, of course, but people with a spark in their eye that is really passionate about what they want to do and want you to contribute to the organization, to the broader field in general that they're going into. So think about how far it is from your place. Think about how flexible or, um, you know, whether the degree structure is something you like, the student life, all of that you can find out in your open days and also strength in your area of interest. So 
I say that because I know like for instance Sydney Uni is very strong in medicine and psychology so that's the place to go to if you want to do things around there. UTS on the other hand is um, stronger in engineering, in data science, in design and those are the you know subjects that you would want to do at UTS. So look at whether the university has strength in the area that you want to do and and go there and I'll leave you with this so you represent the institution and not the other way around so make your mark in the ground and whatever you do represents the university and later the organization that you work for and so every path is a successful one walk your own be resilient um face failure it's okay like rejections are commonplace like I've that tall poppy award for instance I've applied like a number of years in a row and I finally got it this year so like it's you know push boundaries and keep applying for stuff. Um, good luck and best wishes for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, JJ. I'm sure people will have taken a lot of positive and encouraging messages out of that. Now, uh, again, I'd encourage anybody out there to put uh, their questions in, but in in the meantime, JJ, uh, the you might want to be assured that uh, men have imposter uh, syndromes as well. We just don't admit to them. <laughs> but on a more serious point in admitting that I'm one in a wheelchair who probably could do with a complete refit. So if you ever need a lab rat that has everything wrong with him going. But what is your uh, time frame for... Uh, a lot of these bone and uh, muscular and even cellular replacements uh, like the trachea actually being in the, in general use? Yeah, great question. I think it depends on whether you were starting from scratch or you were building on some kind of existing technology. So I say that because there are a range of like, say, if you work in the medical devices field, if you're already working on materials that have been clinically approved and are already in human use, then building on that is potentially quite quick, like getting the regulatory approval. And also if you have industry partnering, that could potentially face the market in a, in a matter of like one or two years um, if we talk about a really accelerated path whereas if you build up something from scratch like the EVs like the extracellular vesicles kind of therapy that is quite new like the whole field is still working on it like that there is I guess no clinically approved therapy the FDA like regulatory bodies have to think of new guidelines for <laughs> this kind of therapy to even be used in patients that could potentially take anything from five to ten years. So re really, we can't judge this against what we saw, say, in the COVID uh, emergency. Where no, of course suddenly... not. Yeah, that was a international emergency and you can see how quickly things got approved but then you have to we have to keep in mind that this was really standing on the shoulders of giants so the technology was there like all the stuff around it and you'll be surprised how multidisciplinary this is there's like people that I work with who are in data science and they were using um, artificial intelligence and bioinformatics to be able to compute how to construct the best COVID vaccine and obviously you need like virologists and people to like understand how the disease works and you know how the vaccine works um you know how do you what, what parts of the virus are you supposed to target and then you need like medical scientists to be able to figure out like how to best deliver it into patients you know what what is the efficacy of the of the thing you need business people and patenting people obviously to bring it into the clinic and all of that amazingly happened in the last like what a year a year or like under under two years since when the um, thing happened but that was really a global coordinated effort um and I think it just shows like how amazing things can be if everyone works together so um I, I guess yes if we have a global emergency like that then that is really um testing to the fact that biomedical technology can advance at such a rapid pace and all these vaccines although got approved under under exception though um, it was a, like an accelerator pathway because I guess the um, not being able to know about the long-term consequences or the long-term effects of a treatment like that. Um, there is some risk there, but the risk is greatly outweighed by the benefits of immunizing the overall population. So, so what would you say to somebody listening who, of course, is listening to that 
and has just lived through COVID themselves. And they're probably asking, well, that's what they did on the macro level, but how is it relevant to me as I look at being a, a graduating student from school and, and then trying to go into university? How do I relate to that macro level? Sorry, so like on the student level, what 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 is? What well, on on the student level, I guess um, they may see all of that as too big. How do you break that down into something or a subject that you might do that might key into a, a global or even a local collaboration? How do these things sort of come together? Yeah, so that. Um... <laughs> comes from multiple different levels so I guess like you know if vaccines like as a type of medical technology is the sort of thing that you're interested in then um, yeah, I guess you got to think about what you're best at and how like what can you see yourself doing in the future so if you come out as a science degree um, then likely you might be actually working in a lab um, in research and be part of the people building up these discoveries or at least the knowledge needed to be able to make these vaccines or otherwise you could be like I guess um, the the engineers or the data scientists who go and build the, the the vectors or use the and build the algorithm for instance to compute the vaccines or you could be part of the um, if you do a business degree then you could be part of the commercialization part of the company to take these things forward so I guess like you know that's what I was trying to say about you can come at the same problem problem with different um, angles and any kind of advance, not just medical, but any kind of advance really requires a coordinated effort from everybody <laughs> with different types of expertise. Like you can't be one person and be across like everything. We need people to come at it in all different kind of aspects. And I guess um, this is what you'll find through your degree. Like I think having a combined degree is not a bad choice if you really don't know where to go because um, I mean, like, you know, I guess from the student level, if you start off with a science or engineering degree, that'll equip you with the skills to be able to diversify into other areas quite easily. And then you can get into the degree first if you like it first. And then you can specialize into, say, uh, medical biotechnology or agriculture or, um, you know, microorganisms or something. Um, and that, that'll obviously expose you to different uh, career pathways like I don't know, analyzing soil <laughs> or like um, studying evolution or um, even developing better agricultural technologies to be able to make plants grow better. And so if, if you were to look back on everything you have done, um, both in, in the lab and um, in the university lecture theater, what would be one thing you'd like to do that you haven't ticked off your list? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, like, I think in my second mind, like, I've always wanted to be a vet. And that was one of my other options at the time. And I think what might have turned me off was um, the fact that I had to spend a period of rural experience and I didn't want to go there and treat like cows and sheep. Um, like I, I wanted to be like more in the small animal, kind of more like exotic animals um, area. So I think um, if anything, like uh, I, I actually was thinking this at the time, like when I was in limbo about whether I would get my fellowship or not to come back into research. And I was thinking maybe I could do a, a secondary like vet degree and become a vet. And then I've actually like my previous mentor at the calling was a was they they actually was trained as a vet surgeon and then later on became a basic scientist. And then like they operate on mice as part of the disease model that they're using. So I think it's actually quite a useful skill. And then the other thing probably is, um, and I think this ties into, if you ask me the question of what has, what I found really inspiring is, um, if you guys go and Google this person called Robert Langer, better known as Bob Langer from MIT, so Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology in the States. So he's the top engineer, like biomedical engineer, like in the world. Like his papers got cited like 300,000 times or something ridiculous amount and he was the person behind the um, Modena vaccine as well and he was the person that 
uh, together with his colleagues back in 1993, coined the term, like he was the one that pioneered the field of tissue engineering that I'm working in now. And I was in a number of webinars listening to his talks and stuff. And he said that, um, you know, like in his early days, he faced a couple of rejections uh, when he had this idea of using polymers, which were always thought of as like manufacturing materials, like plastic bottles and I don't know, whatever not. And he thought about putting those like biocompatible polymers inside the body to help the body regrow tissues. And that's where tissue engineering came from. But then that idea got rejected by like a ridiculous number of um, universities because they all thought like all the polymer scientists at the time thought his idea was ridiculous. And they they were like, oh, you know what? Like, Bob, you'd, you'd better think of an alternate career because this is not going to work. And guess what happened? Like, he just kept going and he created a field out of it. So, like, that was my biggest inspiration, I suppose, when I heard that story. And that's, you know, sort of, I guess, shaped my view on rejections that um, if you if it's something you really believe in, you just got to persist and go for it and, and don't listen to those other stupid voices because they may not be correct, even if they're much more senior than you. And so I guess, you know, to answer that question, the reason why I was saying this was that um, I would really like to have the opportunity to really um, meet Bob in person, if I could. Yeah. So is he still um, working and producing the papers that are yeah, yeah, cited? He is. Yeah, he is. Um, actually, like, interestingly, like, my previous PhD supervisor is doing a period of exchange with him right now at MIT. And, um, and yeah, we've seen some videos that they've recorded. And it's just, it's, it's, he's an amazing guy. But, yeah, he's still working. And he's got this wall of just, like, awards and, <laughs> um, yeah, like, accreditations and everything. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Well, I'm sure that's something that uh, we'll see you obtain in the future. I guess uh, one last question. You did say um, you did some advocacy and were on multiple com committees in your field. What is the one thing that you are looking for from governments to support scientists now and in the future? That's a, a simple and a difficult question to answer. Um, and I would say that we definitely need a lot more support for just science and not just medical research, just scientific research in general, because I feel like um, Australia is way punching above our way in terms of medical advances. And we like a lot of um, amazing discoveries in science came from Australian scientists and engineers and people working in these fields. But without ongoing support, then, um, you know, our sector is losing talent to overseas. I know of people who've um, unfortunately left the country because um, they were not able to get the support for their research that they had hoped for and so um, that is one aspect the other aspect is to um, I hope more people can step up not just people like myself but really anywhere um anything like just to say that STEM is for everybody um it's not necessary that you have to have done a degree in science or engineering like Pete we partner with lawyers with um patenting attorneys with commercialization experts and STEM is for everybody so it's just um we need these fields to really uh you know take off to be able to continuously create new technologies that better people's lives and it's a coordinated effort and it's also um that diversity is extremely important. So we say that from several different aspects. It's gender diversity, it's cultural diversity, it's, um, you know, people like you and I who might have external or internal disabilities that people don't see. And it's it needs to be inclusive and STEM has a place for everybody. And we need to have different representations of who could be a successful STEM professional, which in my opinion should be for everybody. So... Well, thank you very much, Jada. On the point of um, STEM being for everyone, I think that's a, a wonderful point to consider as we leave, because unfortunately, we could go on all afternoon, I think, <laughs> but we have to wrap things up now. So again, thank you very much for your presentation today. I'm sure you've inspired a number of our listeners to hopefully go on and make applications to various universities and do attend the open days and learn firsthand what 
the options are for you. And remember, everybody has imposter system. And <laughs> if you end up being in the wrong course, just wait a year and you can always transfer to something else. Take it from someone who knows. So again, JJ, thank you very much for giving us an insight into tissue engineering and giving us hope that in the future, a lot of people will be in a lot less pain and live better a lot longer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invite. It was a pleasure. <laughs>